Today we're going to continue our study on the subject of dangers and deceptions. And one of the most important things that God has entrusted us with is our faith. Our faith is so important that God said, without it, you cannot please Him. For it is impossible to please God without faith. So faith is vital. It's like the heart, if you will, of your spiritual walk. It needs to be guarded. In that light, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 teaches us that above all else, look here, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it comes the wellsprings of life. Let me tell you something. You can take a few traumatic blows spiritually and be neutralized for months. Satan wants that. He knows how to neutralize you. He goes after your weakest points. So we must use the shield of faith to extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one. I want you to see that for yourself in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 6. Just hold your finger and flip over there. We're going to start in verse 10, read down, okay? What I'm trying to impart to you is if your faith is strong, you're not going to be easily deceived. That's where we're headed, okay? If your faith is strong, it's it's being used in every aspect of your life. It's going to be hard to deceive you because faith doesn't come out of the air. Faith comes from hearing the living Word. Mm -hmm. And when you've got the living Word of God going in you on a very regular basis, it's cutting, it's sharpening, Mm -hmm. it's removing, it's correcting, it's building, it's it's, um, guiding the Word. The Word will guide you. And the Word will give you discernment beyond these eyes, Mm -hmm. beyond these ears. The sermon comes from within. It comes from above. It's, that's what is one of the most key factors in defending yourself against the wiles and the schemes of the evil one is your discerning heart. I, I, I've heard some people say it just, mm, it, just, it just doesn't pass the smell test. You know, people, they, they uh, are bringing a new doctrine or something and... Uh, Your ears perk up and your heart says, nah, that's not from God's Word. I don't know where you got that, but that's not from the Scripture. See, discernment will give you the insight and the boldness to say that. Mm -hmm. So faith is critical, and the Bible talks about how how important it is. I've named a few. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? And here you're going to see in Ephesians 6 that God says your faith can be used as a shield to extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one. You need to understand this, not just in in a theological perspective. You need to understand how to implement it in your life. Let Let me give you one example. You're going about your day and all of a sudden you have these terrible thoughts of temptation or unholy thoughts of immorality. That thought has been sown in you through something that came in your eye gates or your ear gates previously. And now it wants to germinate inside you. And if you meditate upon it and don't check it at the door, it will grow. And it will grow into action. And the action ultimately is sin. See how... But the scripture has a remedy. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says that, that you and I have power to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. So your thoughts, if they're not checked, if they are unholy, can lead to sin. Point. Amen. 
Amen. Okay, you got to get that. So here, yeah. I want you to see how using your faith to walk in the passage in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that I just talked about, that you and I would extinguish those nasty thoughts that lead to sin in our lives. Amen. Amen. Tracking me so far. Amen. So it's your faith. It's your faith that moves you. Oh, I remember that scripture. Okay? I know that scripture. And how, how can I utilize that scripture? How does that work in my life? So the next time you have these unholy thoughts, that scripture comes to your mind, and you go, mm, I'm, I'm not going to tolerate this. This is God's temple. I'm going to use my faith and extinguish and take that thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. There, there's a full circle example from a temptation to a discernment to the exercising of your faith to the utilization of that scripture to take that thought captive and put it to bed. Amen. Put, it to, put it to death, rather. Mm-hmm. Okay? Does that help you? Does that help you? I hope. Yes. Yes. All right. So here, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers, against the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now look at this. Look at verse 16. Everybody take a really close, hard look at verse 16. What's the first two words you see there? Above all. all. Name one other place that you've heard above all in the Scripture, even in this sermon. Above all, guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23 So again here, in Ephesians 6.16, note that. Ephesians 6.16, this is important. He wants you to pay attention if he says verily, verily. He wants you to pay, it's an imperative, meaning, hey, this is important, pay attention here. He's saying, above all, taking the shield of what? Faith. Faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. I don't know about you, but that sounded a lot like victory to me. Amen. It didn't say some. It said all. So, if I was your enemy, and I understood this law, this spiritual law, what would be my strategy to trip you up? Weaken your faith. Because if you have weak faith, you won't do, you won't walk, you won't declare, you won't accept the things that I just declared to you about that unholy thought that you just had. You'll just accept it. It'll just abide with you. Mm-hmm. And then it'll come back. And then it'll, it'll fester. Mm-hmm. And then, next thing you know, you're in full-blown sin. Amen. Do you see how he works? This requires discernment. This requires action. This requires faith. Amen. So that's the reason I'm preaching, preaching, preaching for weeks on how to understand how precious your faith is. Without it, it is impossible to please God. Without it, you're not going to extinguish any fiery dart Amen. that's going to try to take you out and take you down and crush your faith. No. God said, above all. Above all. Taking the shield of faith with which you, not him, you, will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Saints, you're in a war. You're in a, you just read that the struggle, the, everybody say struggle. struggle. We are in a struggle, yes. a spiritual struggle. And the tanks and the F-15s 
and the guns and the and the artillery is not going to touch this. Amen. But faith will. Exercising your faith will extinguish those fiery attacks that Satan wants to come at you with. I hope we just had a few light bulb moments right there. All right? So, how, how do you train yourself? I'm telling you, you have to understand that these thoughts are your enemy. And the minute you tolerate them, they've already taken root. By tolerating, they are spreading roots. Once that happens, you're in the battle way farther down the road than you think. So it's important to train yourself that at the second that thought comes into your heart, what do you do? You, you, you literally saturate your soul with God's instruction on how to deal with it. And then you declare it out of your mouth. Not think it, say it. The Apostle Paul said, I believe, so therefore I speak. So if you believe that this scripture in 2 Corinthians, turn there with me. If you believe this, then you have to act. Uh, let, me, let me put it like this. Spiritual things are consummated through agreement. Let me show you an example at a marriage ceremony. A man and a woman, two different last names, two different families, two different bloodlines. They come together under God and they make an agreement. And then they vocalize the agreement. And when they agree to the terms that they have announced with their mouth, the man of God says, I pronounce you man and wife. You are no longer two, but you have become one under God. What happened? Two different individuals became one under God through the proclamation of, of agreement. So if you agree with these thoughts, they're in. They're staying. They're working. If you disagree and then exercise the sword of the Spirit, meaning the Word of God, against it, it has to go because the Word of the Lord triumphs everything. Amen. It says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit to God, then resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. Those unholy thoughts that lead to sin are not from God. Amen. Amen. And here it says, You. You have the power to deal with it. Let me show you a fine example. Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 was approached by the evil one himself. Notice that the evil one quoted scripture directly to Jesus. Is that not frightening to you? If he's quoting scripture to the one who created him, what does that say? Who are we? Amen. And do you notice? That, ponder this with me. Fly over that day like a bird. Did Jesus call the legion of angels in that moment on the mountains of temptation? Matthew 4.4. 4? No. Did, did he call on the Father? No. What did he do? He declared the word of God. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. And Satan left him. Right there is a real life scriptural example of what I'm teaching. Jesus Christ did it himself. Tracking that? Amen. Now in 2 Corinthians... Hold on just a second here. Hold on just a second, brother. I said earlier in the recording, 2 Corinthians 5.10, but it's 10.5. So, um, we need to correct that. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Amen. 
Let's start at verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. There. It says, and let me tell you why I'm reading this. Because I say, okay, here's the scenario. Evil thoughts come into your mind, tempting you to sin. What do you do? Accept it. Reject it. Tolerate it. Don't do anything. You reject it. But do you stop there? No. The Bible says that you have power to take that thought captive. How is that done? Where's the on switch? How does that engage? Do you, do you call on angels? Do you call your sister in the Lord? Do you call the preacher? No. Look at what this says. Listen closely. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. It says, For we walk, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. What's that war referring to? In Ephesians 6, it said there was a struggle. Remember? In other words, a struggle would be trying to pull you in a pattern that you do not want to go. And you pulling back, saying, I'm not going. Does that not picture a struggle? Right? It says, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against, uh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down what? Strongholds. Strongholds. Picture this. A man seven feet tall, 400 pounds, walks in here. And he walks up to one of the, the children of the church and just picks the child up and cluck, clutches her like this. That is a picture of a stronghold by a strong man. The child is helpless, right? There's no way. The man, the man is 7 feet 400 pounds. There's no way that child is going to break free. That's an image of a struggle. And you're talking about demonic forces in the heavenly realms. So if you lean to your own power, you're done. But if you look to God and Christ and follow His instructions and yield yourself to simple instruction and obey the Word, that strong man is nothing before Jesus Christ. Look at David and Goliath. David and Goliath. This giant man... He could have crushed David if he got a hold of him. David said, not today. In the name of the Lord. And he called him something and took him down. In the name of the Lord. There's power in the name of Jesus. And when you use it, it has authority to move on your behalf and on behalf of the kingdom of God. So you taking a stand... And exercising your faith is an action point that brings glory to God. And it liberates you from this struggle of constantly being tempted and constantly being... And su- Let me just ask this. How many people have suffered from mental suffering? I rest my case. I rest my case. I'm hitting it right on the head here with a big hammer. Because you can stop mental suffering. You can stop it. It's an attack from the enemy. No longer tolerate it. Come to your senses and say, I I do not need to suffer this. I refuse to let this abide in the temple of God in which I am. And where the temple has been set inside of me for the Holy Spirit of God to dwell. I am a gatekeeper. I refuse these thoughts that are unholy in the holy temple of God in which I am. Do you see how quickly... That game changes when you're walking in the authority of God. So it says, in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into, say it with me, captivity to the what? To the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 
You have authority to capture those unholy thoughts that are creating mental suffering inside of you. Your, your body says, I can't do this. It's against God. I don't want to do this. And that thought is taking you down a path that leads to destruction. Amen. If you don't check it, if you don't take it captive and submit it to Christ, it will torment you. Mental torment will abide unless you use the Word of God to eradicate it. This is how you can guard your faith. And weak faith is not going to operate at this level that I just described to you. This kind of faith is dangerous to the enemy. Because you can stop the temptation. And if you stop the temptation, Satan has no other power over you except that which God would give him or that which you release to him. Stop. He only can tempt you. And if he, that's all he came, that was his toolbox with Jesus. He kept throwing carrots out in front of Jesus like he's going to tempt the Son of the living God. How foolish. It's, it's, a, it's eye-opening, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. It's very, very much eye-opening. So it, I hope that in just this short exhortation that you have caught a spiritual discipline that will free you from mental suffering. This is a discipline that has to be exercised. I, I catch myself driving down the road and I'll have this crazy thought. I, I thought, good, good night. I'm a man of God. I'm not supposed to be thinking like that. Oh, this is my cue. This is my cue. I say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take this thought captive and I make it obedient to my God, my Lord, and my Savior. And I refuse to let this thought abide in me. In Jesus' name, leave me. Just that fast, my mind will change. This is war. And if you think it's not, you're greatly deceived. So in 2 John, by the way, that was not planned. What I just gave you was not in my notes. So we'll, we're going to pick right back up where we left. In 2 John chapter 7. I start out reading in verse 3. Are you still with me? <clears throat> Second John 3. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and in love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Let me stop right there in verse 6. What... That discipline of taking the thought captive in your mind and declaring the name of Jesus over it and disagreeing with it. Remember, spiritual things are consummated through agreement. Let me give you the scripture. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So when, you, when, you, when, a, when the, the man and the woman come together for holy matrimony, what are they doing? They're, they're, they're in a binding agreement. To become one before God. Yes. And they, they agree before God not to leave the other one even unto death. See, that bind is, is another term for a legal agreement. In the courts of law, they'll say, this is binding. In the insurance companies, 
they, they buying coverage over a property, over a car. I get emails. Okay, Pastor, we got that church, ba- we got that, that bus, it's, it's bound. It's good. You can roll it. So when, when you take that thought captive, you're binding it. And you're dismissing it from your thoughts under the authority of the holy name of Jesus. This is an invisible discipline. You can't see what I'm talking about. But you can walk in what I'm talking about. And this requires faith. See? It requires faith. The discipline I just announced to you is in the Scripture, but you have to walk in it. If I'm trying to give Brother Craig a gift, and I'm steady holding the gift out, and he's not paying me no mind, guess he's probably not going to get his gift. He has to receive it. So in these disciplines of faith, you have to receive them. And you have to apply them. You have to, action with action steps, obey them, or they're, they're of no use to you. Does that help you? Now, this whole subject today is about guarding your faith. And the, the overall teaching is the dangers and deceptions. The Bible writes a lot about the dangers and deceptions. We've been teaching on it for four weeks. But look here in 2 John 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. Some of you know, I, I've been in the Middle East off and on over, the, over many, many years. And one thing they will challenge you on is the, the virgin birth. And they will also challenge you that Jesus was just a prophet. He was just a good man. He was not God. That those words are is the spirit of the antichrist. Run from that. Amen. Run from that person because you've you've went face to face with the spirit of the antichrist. You got to pay attention these days, Amen. and this is warning you to do that. You see what it said? So what's the, what's the break point? It says, "For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not what confess." Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Now we know he came in the flesh. We know exactly where he was born. We know that he lived 33 and a half years. We know where he was buried. We know that he was crucified. We know that he raised from the dead. When I was in Israel, I had an Israeli soldier. uh, I was chatting with him and I was talking with him and I was talking with him about Christ. He goes, "Uh, are you talking about Yeshua? And I said, yes. He goes, Scott, he's written about in all my school books. I said, what? He goes, yeah. He goes, you're talking about Yeshua that walked on the water five miles from my house on Lake Gennesaret. I said, yeah. He goes, everybody knows this. Young Israeli soldier. Lives five miles from where Jesus walked on the water. It was first-hand news to him. Believe it. He's alive. Believe it. Rejoice over it. For he is in you, and you're going to see where he lives soon. It says here in verse 8, Look to yourselves. That we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine... Do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. It says, having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so with some paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak to you face to face that our joy may be full. The children 
the children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. What These are the foundations of discerning when you're being confronted with the spirit of the Antichrist. Did Jesus Christ come to earth in, a, in bodily form? Yes. How did he come? Virgin birth. How long did he live? 33 and a half years. Was he crucified? Yes. Was he buried? Yes. Was he raised from the dead? Yes. Did he uh, speak and interact with humans? Yes. Over 500 plus the disciples. Did he ascend into heaven? Yes. Where is he now? He's seated at the right hand of God in his priestly high priest office forever. What is he doing? He's making intercession that you and I come home. Amen. And that we have a safe journey. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited about that. Amen. I'm thrilled about that. That we're on our way to see Jesus, the King of Kings, the one who made all things, the one who holds all things together by his spoken word. Amen. That's who you've come here to worship. Yes, yes. And God does not want you subject to the follies of the evil one. He's telling you, wake up. You're in a war, a war. A war, a war, you're in a war, pay attention. You're not talking about him taking your Tonka truck or your Barbie doll. He wants to kill your faith. Amen. There's never been a more serious sermon. Amen. You have to pay attention. Thank you for letting me share.